Welcome to this Walden Tapes program. Part of a series of classic and contemporary science fiction and fantasy adapted on cassette. In Arthur C. Clarke's well-known story, Rendezvous with Rama, an immense UFO is propelled through outer space towards Earth. When a team of astronauts contacts the intruder, which is codenamed Rama, they discover that it is an ancient, self-contained world. By the year 2130, the Mars-based radars were discovering new asteroids at the rate of a dozen a day. The Space Guard computers automatically calculated their orbits and stored the information in their own enormous memories. The object first cataloged as 31-439, according to the year and the order of its discovery, was detected while it was still outside the orbit of Jupiter. There was nothing unusual about its location, but a first radar contact at such a distance was unprecedented. Clearly, 31-439 must be of exceptional size. From the strength of the echo, the computers deduced a diameter of at least 40 kilometers. It was not traveling on a normal asteroidal path, along an ellipse which it retraced with clockwork precision every few years. It was a lonely wanderer among the stars making its first and last visit to the solar system, for it was moving so swiftly that the gravitational field of the sun could never capture it. It would flash inward past the orbits of Jupiter, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury, gaining speed as it did so, until it rounded the sun and headed out once again into the unknown. It was at this point that the computers started flashing their we-have-something-interesting sign, and for the first time, 31-439 came to the attention of human beings. There was a brief flurry of excitement at Space Guard headquarters, and the interstellar vagabond was quickly dignified by a name instead of a mere number. Long ago, the astronomers had exhausted Greek and Roman mythology. Now they were working through the Hindu pantheon. And so 31-439 was christened Rama. For a few days, the news media made a fuss over the visitor, but because only two facts were known about it its unusual orbit and its approximate size, the world soon forgot about Rama. But the astronomers did not. Their excitement grew with the passing months as the new asteroid presented them with more and more puzzles. First of all, there was the problem of Rama's light curve. All known asteroids showed a variation in their brilliance, waxing and waning in a period of a few hours, an inevitable result of their spin and their irregular shape. Rama showed no such changes. Either it was not spinning at all, or it was perfectly symmetrical. Both explanations seemed unlikely. There the matter rested for several months. An astronomer with access to the far side 200-meter reflector made the discovery. The sunlight reflected from Rama showed a very small variation. Rama was spinning. But whereas the normal day for an asteroid was several hours... Rama's was only four minutes. At its equator, this tiny world must be spinning at more than a thousand kilometers an hour. An object 40 kilometers across, with a rotation period of only four minutes. Where did that fit into the astronomical scheme of things? Perhaps Rama was a dead sun, a collapsed star, a madly spinning sphere of neutronium, every cubic centimeter weighing billions of tons. But Rama could not possibly be made of condensed matter. No star-sized mass could penetrate so deeply into the solar system without producing disturbances that would have betrayed it long ago. No, it was utterly impossible for an object as massive as a dead sun to sneak up unobserved. In a way, it was a pity... An encounter with a dark star would have been quite exciting while it lasted. The extraordinary meeting of the Space Advisory Council was brief and stormy. The question before the Council was straightforward enough. There was no doubt that Rama was an unusual object, but was it an important one? In a few months, it would be gone forever, so there was little time in which to act. A space probe soon to be launched from Mars to go beyond Neptune could be modified and sent on a high-speed trajectory to meet Rama. 
There was no hope of a rendezvous, for the two bodies would pass each other at 200,000 kilometers an hour. Rama would be observed intensively for only a few minutes, and in real close-up for less than a second. But with the right instrumentation, that would be long enough to settle many questions. Three months later, the space probe was launched from Phobos, the inner moon of Mars. The first images, from 10,000 kilometers away, brought to a halt the activities of all mankind. No one could pretend any longer that Rama was a natural object. Its body was a cylinder, geometrically perfect and 50 kilometers long. The two ends were quite flat, apart from some small structures at the center of one face, and were 20 kilometers across. Rama looked almost comically like an ordinary domestic boiler, dull, drab gray, and completely devoid of markings. The images from the other cameras added nothing new. However, the trajectories their pods traced through Rama's minute gravitational field gave one other vital piece of information, the mass of the cylinder. It was far too light to be a solid body. To nobody's great surprise, it was clear that Rama must be hollow. The long hoped for, long feared encounter had come at last. Mankind was about to receive the first visitor from the stars. Commander Norton remembered those first TV transmissions, which he'd replayed so many times during the final minutes of the rendezvous. But there was one thing no electronic image could possibly convey, and that was Rama's overwhelming size. He'd never received such an impression when landing on a natural body like the moon or Mars. Those were worlds, and one expected them to be big. His judgment was wholly altered by the fact that this was an artifact, millions of times heavier than anything that man had ever put into space. Norton had looked long and hard at the northern face of Raman choosing the point of touchdown. After much thought, he decided to avoid the clearly marked circular disk that was centered on the pole. He had a strong suspicion that this must be the outer seal of an enormous airlock. It was the logical place for the main entrance, and he thought it might be unwise to block the front door with his own vessel. But if Endeavor touched down even a few meters from the axis, Rama's rapid spin would start his ship slithering across the polar plain, gaining speed at a thousand kilometers an hour. Fortunately, Rama's designers had provided an answer. Equally spaced around the polar axis were three low pillbox-shaped structures, about ten meters in diameter. If Endeavour touched down between any two of these, the centrifugal drift would fetch her up against them, and she would be held firmly in place. Contact in fifteen seconds, said Calvert. The gray pillboxes drifted slowly upward outside the control port. Commander Norton had wondered what he would say at this moment. But now that it was upon him, history chose his words, and he spoke almost automatically. Rama base, Endeavor has landed. Endeavor and Rama were heading sunward like a single body. In 40 days they would reach perihelion and pass within 20 million kilometers of the sun. That was too close for comfort. Long before then, Endeavor would have to use her remaining fuel to nudge herself into a safer orbit. The crew would have perhaps three weeks of exploring time before they parted from Rama forever. Rama was silent as a tomb. No electrical currents, no radioactivity. It was almost ominously quiet. One might have expected that even an asteroid would be noisier. On the first EVA, Norton took only one companion, Lieutenant Commander Carl Mercer, his tough and resourceful life support officer. The nearest pillbox was only 10 meters from the airlock, and Norton's first concern was to check the circular structure to determine its purpose. He traveled only a few meters when he came across an interruption in the smooth, apparently metallic wall. Six radial grooves, or slots, were deeply recessed in the metal, and lying in them were six crossed bars, like the spokes of a rimless wheel. He noticed that there were deeper recesses at the ends of the spokes, nicely shaped to accept a clutching hand. Claw? Tentacle? He took hold and pulled. Smooth as silk, the wheel slid out of the wall. He grasped 
two opposing spokes of the windlass and braced his feet against the ground. There was no resistance. The wheel rotated almost effortlessly through a full circle. Then, half a meter away, the curving wall of the pillbox started to move like a slowly opening clamshell. A few particles of dust driven by wisps of escaping air streamed outward like dazzling diamonds as the brilliant sunlight caught them. The road to Rama lay open. The Rama Committee met at the United Planet headquarters on the moon. Seven colleagues, each representing one of the members of the United Planets, were all present, as were specialists who had been co-opted to the committee. Dr. Bose had been born on Earth and had not emigrated to Mars until he was 30, so he felt that he could view the political situation fairly dispassionately. Professor Davidson was an old acquaintance. The exobiologist, Carlisle Pereira, was another obvious choice. So was Dennis Solomons, the science historian. Bose was slightly less happy about the presence of Conrad Taylor, the celebrated anthropologist who had made his reputation by uniquely combining scholarship and eroticism in his study of puberty rites in late 20th century Beverly Hills. No one, however, could possibly have disputed the right of Sir Louis Sands to be on the committee. A man whose knowledge was matched only by his urbanity... Sir Lewis was reputed to lose his composure only when called the Arnold Toynbee of his age. Dr. Bose, His Excellency the Ambassador from Mars to the United Planets, called his wandering thoughts to order and said, Gentlemen, the committee is now assembled to deal with the unique situation. The directive that the Secretary General has given us is to evaluate that situation and to advise Commander Norton when necessary. This uh, Commander Norton, said Sir Robert McKay, the ambassador from Earth, has a tremendous responsibility. Uh, what sort of person is he? I can answer that, said Professor Davidson. His fingers flew over the keyboard of his memory pad. He frowned at the screenful of information and started to make an instant synopsis. William Tsing Norton, born 2077, Brisbane, Oceania. Educated Sydney, Bombay, Houston. Then five years at Astrograd, specializing in propulsion. Commissioned in 2102, rose through usual ranks, lieutenant on the 3rd Persephone Expedition. Distinguished himself during 15th attempt to establish base on Venus. Uh, hmm. Exemplary record. Dual citizenship, Earth and Mars. Wife and one child in Brisbane. Wife and two in Port Lowell, with option on third. Wife? asked Taylor innocently. No, child, of course, snapped the professor before he caught the grin on the other's face. Appointed commanding officer, solar survey research vessel, Endeavour. First voyage to retrograde satellites of Jupiter. Hmm, and that was a tricky one. The record proves only that he is competent, objected the ambassador for Mercury. How will he react in a novel situation like this? The historian Sir Louis Sands cleared his throat. If Rama is dead or unoccupied, and so far all the evidence suggests that it is, Norton is in the position of an archaeologist discovering the ruins of an extinct culture. The danger is minimal, Sir Robert interjected. We still have the possibility of an active inhabited Rama, an encounter between two cultures is almost invariably disastrous for one or for both parties. The argument had reached the takeoff point and was now self sustaining. Bose sat back in his chair, said little, and waited for a consensus to emerge. It was just as he had predicted. Everyone agreed that once he had opened the first door, it was inconceivable that Commander Norton should not open the second. If his wives ever compared his videograms, Commander Norton thought with more amusement than concern. It would involve him in a lot of extra work. Sorry I'm a day late with this transmission, said Norton. But I've been away from the ship for the last 30 hours, believe it or not. Don't be alarmed. Everything's going perfectly. It's taken us two days, but we're almost through the airlock complex. We could have done it in a couple of hours if we'd known what we do now, but we took no chances. 
sent remote cameras ahead and cycled all the locks a dozen times to make sure they wouldn't seize up behind us after we'd gone through. The Ramans really made sure of things. There are three of these cylinder locks, one after the other, just inside the outer hull and below the entry pillbox. And that's only the beginning. The final lock opens into a straight corridor, almost half a kilometer long. It looks clean and tidy like everything else we've seen. These people seem to have done everything in threes. We're in the final lock chamber now, waiting for the okay from Earth before we go through. The interior of Rama is only a few meters away. I'll be a lot happier when the suspense is over. You know, back at the beginning of the 20th century, an archaeologist found the tomb of an Egyptian king, the first one that hadn't been looted by robbers. I feel a bit like he must have. <laughs> Perhaps this place is also a tomb. It seems more and more likely. Even now, there's still not the slightest sign or hint of any activity. Well, tomorrow we should know. Norton switched the recorder to hold. By the time they saw these images and heard these words, he would be inside Rama, for better or for worse. No one had spoken over the radio circuits for at least five minutes. Mercer had simply given the OK sign and had waved him toward the open tunnel. Norton flicked on the beam of his flashlight, triggered his jets, and drifted slowly down the short corridor, trailing his safety line behind him. Only seconds later, he was inside. Inside what? All before him was total darkness. Not a glimmer of light was reflected back from the beam. He drifted slowly through the darkness until the momentum damper at the end of the safety line braked him gently to a halt. He swept the beam of the flashlight down from the nothingness ahead to examine the surface from which he had emerged. He might have been hovering over the center of a small crater. On either side rose a complex of terraces and ramps, all geometrically precise and obviously artificial. About a hundred meters away, he could see the exits of the other two airlock systems, identical with this one. And that was all. There was nothing particularly exotic or alien about the scene. In fact, it bore a considerable resemblance to an abandoned mine. He reported to his anxiously waiting companions. I'm sending out the flare. Two-minute delay. Even the millions of candle power of the flare could not light up the whole of this enormous cavity. He was at one end of a hollow cylinder at least ten kilometers wide. From his viewpoint at the central axis, he could see a mass of detail on the curving walls surrounding him. All around him, the terrace slopes of crater rose up until they merged into the solid wall that rimmed the sky. No, that impression was false. He must discard the instincts both of Earth and of space and reorientate himself to a new system of coordinates. He was not at the lowest point of this strange inside-out world, but the highest. From here, all directions were down, not up. If he moved away from this central axis, toward the curving wall, gravity would steadily increase. When he reached the inside surface of the cylinder, he could stand upright on it at any point, feet toward the stars and head toward the center of the spinning drum. The concept was familiar enough since the earliest dawn of spaceflight, centrifugal force had been used to simulate gravity. It was only the scale of this application that was so overwhelming. The tube of landscape that enclosed him was modeled with areas of light and shade that could have been forests, fields, frozen lakes, or towns. The distance and the fading illumination of the flare made identification impossible. Narrow lines that could be highways, canals, or well-trained rivers formed a faintly visible geometric network, and far along the cylinder, at the very limit of vision, was a band of deeper darkness. It formed a complete circle, ringing the interior of this world, and Norton suddenly recalled the myth of Oceanus, the sea that the ancients believed surrounded the earth. Here, perhaps, was an even stranger sea, not circular, but cylindrical, 
Before it became frozen in the interstellar night, did it have waves and tides and currents and fish? The flare died. The moment of revelation was over. On moon, the members of the Rama Committee relaxed, then started to examine the maps and photographs spread in front of them. Commander Norton's voice added a dimension no pictures could convey. We have now launched five long delay flares down the axis of the cylinder and so have a good photo coverage of its full length. All the main features are mapped. We've given them provisional names. The interior cavity is 50 kilometers long and 16 wide. The two ends are bowl-shaped with rather complicated geometrics. We've called ours the Northern Hemisphere and are establishing our first base here at the axis. Radiating from the central hub, three ladders almost a kilometer long all lead to a ring-shaped plateau. From that, three enormous stairways go all the way down to the plain. Now, if you imagine an umbrella with only three ribs equally spaced, you'll have a good idea of this end of Rama. The stairways, well, we've called them Alpha, Beta, Gamma, aren't continuous but break at five more circular terraces. We estimate there must be between 20 and 30,000 steps. The southern hemisphere looks quite different. It has no stairways and no flat central hub. Instead, there's a huge spike, kilometers long, jutting along the axis with six smaller ones around it. The cylindrical section between the two bowls we've called the central plane. It may seem crazy to use the word plane to describe something so obviously curved, but it will appear flat to us when we get down there. The most striking feature of the central plane is the 10 kilometer wide dark band running completely around it at the halfway mark. It looks like ice, so we've christened it the cylindrical sea. Right out in the middle, there's a large oval island, about 10 kilometers long and three wide, and covered with tall structures. Because it reminds us of old Manhattan, we've called it New York. Yet I don't think it's a city. It seems more like an enormous factory or chemical processing plant. But there are some cities, at least six of them. If they were built for human beings, they could each hold about 50,000 people. We've called them Rome, Peking, Paris, Moscow, London, Tokyo. We've 4,000 square kilometers to explore and only a few weeks to do it in. I wonder if we'll ever learn the answer to the two mysteries that have been haunting me ever since we got inside. Who were they? And what went wrong? Uh, Mr. Ambassador, Dr. Carlisle Pereira began, I think what we have here is a space arc. It is an old idea in the field of exobiology. Some writers suggested that these space arcs should be built in the form of concentric spheres. Others proposed hollow spinning cylinders so that centrifugal force could provide artificial gravity, exactly what we found in Rama. Uh, we now have a very precise determination of its orbit and its velocity. We expected that it would be coming from the direction of a nearby star, but that isn't the case at all. It's more than 200,000 years since Rama passed any star. If our present theories of stellar evolution are correct, this star could never have had life-bearing planets. So Rama has been cruising through space for at least 200,000 years and perhaps for more than a million. Now it's cold and dark and apparently dead, and I think I know why. No closed ecology can be 100% efficient. There is always waste, loss some degradation of the environment and buildup of pollutants. It may take millions of years to poison and wear out the planet, but it will happen in the end. Rama is a ship that exhausted its provisions before it reached its goal. Well, I, I don't pretend to understand what form of automatic guidance is still operating, steering Rama ages after its builders died. And they are dead. I'll stake my reputation on that. All the samples we've taken from the interior are absolutely sterile. For my part, I'm sorry. It would have been wonderful to, to have met another intelligent species. But at least we have answered one ancient question. We are not alone. The stars will never again be the same to us.
Commander Norton was sorely tempted. But as captain, his first duty was to his ship. His second officer, Lieutenant Commander Mercer, was the obvious choice to head the initial probe. The authority on life support systems, Carl Mercer had written some of the standard textbooks on the subject. Given Mercer, that automatically selected the next man, his inseparable companion, Lieutenant Joe Calvert. Years ago, Mercer and Calvert had established an apparently stable liaison, so much so that they'd shared a wife back on Earth who had borne each of them a child. Two men were not enough for an exploring team. Long ago, it had been found that three was the optimum, for if one man was lost, two might still escape where a single survivor would be doomed. After a good deal of thought, Norton had chosen technical sergeant Willard Myron, a mechanical genius who could make anything work. They drifted through the last airlock and floated out along the weightless axis of Rama. There was no reason to choose one ladder rather than another. That nearest to airlock Alpha had been selected purely as a matter of convenience. Mercer grasped at the first rung and gently propelled himself along the ladder. Movement was as easy as swimming along the seabed. Easier, in fact, for there was no backward drag of water. In his earphones, he could hear the regular breathing of his two companions. It did not take Mercer long to discover that it was impossible at this one-twentieth of a gravity level to walk down the stairway in the normal manner. The only practical way was to ignore the steps and to use the handrail to pull oneself downward. None of them would admit it, but they all felt like boys again, sliding down the banisters. Mercer glanced up toward the hub of Rama, almost two kilometers above him. The little glow of light and the tiny figures silhouetted against it seemed horribly far away. There's no change of temperature, he reported to Norton. Still just below freezing, but the air pressure is up. Even with this low oxygen content, it's almost breathable. Now, farther down, there'll be no problems at all. In fact, I'm going to take a sniff. Mercer equalized pressure, unlatched the securing clip of his helmet, and opened it a crack. The air of Rama was dead and musty, as if from a tomb so ancient that the last trace of physical corruption had disappeared ages ago. Mercer could detect no recognizable odors. He sealed the helmet again. Even a mountaineer acclimatized to the summit of Everest would die quickly here. But a few kilometers farther down, it would be a different matter. We're coming back, Skipper, he reported. There's no reason to go farther until we're ready to go all the way. Some women, Commander Norton had decided long ago, should not be allowed aboard ship. Weightlessness did things to their breasts that were too damn distracting. It was bad enough when they were motionless, but when they started to move and sympathetic vibrations set in, it was more than any warm-blooded male should be asked to take. He was quite sure that at least one serious space accident had been caused by acute crew distraction after the transit of an unholstered lady officer through the control cabin. He'd once mentioned this theory to Surgeon Commander Laura Ernst, without revealing who had inspired his particular train of thought. There was no need. They knew each other much too well. On Earth, years ago, in a moment of mutual loneliness, they'd once made love. Probably they would never repeat the experience, but could one ever be quite sure of that? Yet whenever the well-built surgeon oscillated into the commander's cabin, he felt a fleeting echo of the old passion. She knew that he felt it, and both were happy. Bill, she began, I've checked our mountaineers, and here's my verdict. They're in good shape. Based on the assumption that we can dispense with breathing gear below the second level, we need to supply only food and water and thermosuits. And we're in business. Going down will be easy. That should take about an hour. Climbing up is harder to estimate. I'd like to allow six hours, including two one-hour periods. What about psychological factors? Hard to assess in such a novel environment. Darkness may be the biggest problem. Thanks, Laura, said Norton. And that's all I want to know.
In the clear, cold atmosphere of Rama, the beam of the searchlight was completely invisible. Three kilometers down from the central hub, the hundred-meter-wide oval of light lay across a section of that colossal stairway. A brilliant oasis in the surrounding darkness, it was sweeping slowly toward the curved plain, still five kilometers below. It had been a completely uneventful descent. They had paused briefly at the second level. Here, they had discarded their oxygen gear and reveled in the strange luxury of being able to breathe without mechanical aids. There was only one more section to go. Gravity had reached almost half its terrestrial value. Rama's centrifugal spin was at last exerting its real strength. Normal walking was now acceptable. Norton had once visited the ruins of an Aztec temple, and the feelings he had then experienced now came echoing back to him, amplified a hundred times. Here was the same sense of awe and mystery, and the sadness of the irrevocably vanished past. Yet the scale here was so much greater. And of course, Rama was hundreds of times older than any structure that had survived on Earth. Yet everything looked absolutely new. There was no sign of wear and tear. Norton looked back along the beam, toward its source up on the axis, more than eight kilometers away. He knew that the crew at the hub would be watching through the telescope. Captain here, he reported over the radio. Everyone in fine shape. No problems. Proceeding as planned. It's still very cold, below freezing, and quiet. Quieter than anything I've ever known on Earth or in space. Here every sound is swallowed up. The space around us is so enormous that there aren't any echoes. It's weird, but I, I hope we'll get used to it. After those interminable stairs, it was a strange luxury to walk once more on a horizontal surface. They might have been walking along a very wide, shallow valley. It was quite impossible to believe that they were really crawling along the inside of a huge cylinder, and that beyond this little oasis of light, the land rose up to meet, no, to become the sky. Though they all felt a sense of confidence and subdued excitement, after a while the almost palpable silence of Rama began to weigh heavily upon them. Every footstep, every word. Vanished instantly into the unreverberant void. Their first destination on this initial traverse was a very prominent and rather mysterious feature, which had been christened the Straight Valley. It was a long groove or trench, forty meters deep and a hundred wide, with gently sloping sides. It had been provisionally identified as an irrigation ditch or canal, like the stairway. It had two similar counterparts, equally spaced on the curve of Rama. The three valleys were almost ten kilometers long, and they stopped abruptly just before they reached the sea, which was strange if they were intended to carry water. And on the other side of the sea, the pattern was repeated. Three more ten-kilometer trenches continued on to the region of the South Pole. Filling the bottom of each was a sheet of flat white material that looked much like ice. With Calvert and Rodrigo acting as anchors and playing out a safety rope. Norton repelled slowly down the steep incline. When he reached the bottom, he found that this material was some kind of glass or transparent crystal. When he touched it with his fingertips, it was cold, hard, and unyielding. Norton tried to peer into the crystalline depths, as one might attempt to gaze through the ice of a frozen lake, but he could see nothing. This stuff was translucent, but not transparent. It now seemed most unlikely that this was a canal. It was simply a peculiar trench that stopped and started abruptly, but led nowhere. And if at any time it had carried liquid, where were the stains, the incrustations of dried-up sediment that one would expect? Everything was bright and clean, as if the builders had left only yesterday. Once again, he was face to face with the fundamental mystery of Rama. There was something very odd indeed about a place that was simultaneously brand new and a million years old. What is it, Skipper? Called Rodrigo. Have you found something? No. Norton answered. There's nothing down here. Haul me up.
I've called this meeting of the committee, said His Excellency the Ambassador from Mars to the United Planets, because Dr. Pereira has something important to tell us. He insists that we get in touch with Commander Norton right away. According to our latest information, Pereira began, one party is now on its way to the cylindrical sea. Well, Commander Norton has another group setting up a supply base at the foot of Stairway Alpha. I would advise an immediate alert and a preparation for total withdrawal at 12 hours' notice. L let me explain. Rama is now well inside the orbit of Minas, yet the interior is still frozen. The reason, of course, is that Rama has not had time to warm up. It must have cooled down to near absolute zero while it was in interstellar space. Now, as it approaches the sun, the outer hull is already as hot as molten lead. But the inside will stay cold until the heat works its way through that kilometer of rock. There's some kind of a fancy dessert with a hot exterior and ice cream in the middle. I don't remember what it's called. Baked Alaska. It's a favorite of UP banquets, unfortunately. Thank you, Sir Robert. Uh, that's the situation in Rama at the moment, but it won't last. All these weeks, the solar heat has been working its way through, and we can expect a sharp temperature rise to begin in a few hours. That's not the problem, however. But then, what's the difficulty? No, I can answer in one word, Mr. Ambassador. Hurricanes! There were now more than 20 men and women inside Rama, six of them down on the plane, the rest ferrying equipment and expendables through the airlock system and down the stairway. The ship itself was almost deserted. The first party to head for the cylindrical sea was led by Surgeon Commander Laura Ernst, with backup members Boris Rodrigo and Sergeant Peter Rousseau. At last, far ahead, at the limits of the now weakening beam, they could see that the plane on which they were walking came to an abrupt stop. They were nearing the edge of the sea. From the level of the plane to that of the sea, if it was a sea, was a sheer straight drop of fifty meters. But for what conceivable reason was the cliff on the southern shore five hundred meters high, instead of the fifty here? From their vantage point, it was possible for the first time to appreciate the curvature of Rama. But no one had ever seen a frozen lake bent upward into a cylindrical surface. That was distinctively unsettling. And out there, beyond their distorted shadows and the outer limit of the beam, lay the island that dominated the cylindrical sea. Hub control, Dr. Ernst radioed. Please aim your beam at New York. The night of Rama fell suddenly upon them as the oval of light went sliding out to sea and the towers of New York sprang into view. The resemblance to old-time Manhattan was only superficial. The real New York, like all of man's habitations, had never been finished, still less had it been designed. This place, however, had an overall symmetry and pattern. It had been conceived by some controlling intelligence, and then it had been completed like a machine devised for some specific purpose. The beam of the searchlight slowly tracked along those distant towers and domes and interlocked spheres and crisscrossed tombs. But there was nothing that they could see here that was not already shown in greater detail on photographs taken from the hub. After a few minutes... They called for the light to return to them and began to walk eastward along the edge of the cliff towards a flight of steps leading down to the sea. Dr. Ernst got Commander Norton's permission to descend. A minute later, she was cautiously testing the surface of the sea. Her foot slithered almost frictionlessly back and forth. The material felt exactly like ice. It was ice. When she struck it with her hammer, a familiar pattern of cracks radiated from the impact point, and she had no difficulty in collecting as many pieces as she wished. Some had already melted when she held up the sample holder to the light. She took a cautious sniff. It's water, but I wouldn't care to drink it. It smells like an algae culture that's gone bad. I can hardly wait to get it to the lab. Dr. Ernst held up the small sample bottle in triumph. Let's head for home. 
They turned toward the distant lights of the hub, moving with the gentle loping strides that had proved the most comfortable means of walking under this reduced gravity. Often they looked back, drawn by the hidden enigma of the island out there in the center of the frozen sea. And just once, Dr. Ernst thought she felt the faint suspicion of a breeze against her cheek. It did not come again, and she quickly forgot about it. With a little imagination, Norton told himself he could pretend this was an improvised night camp at the foot of some mountain in a remote region of Asia or America. Excuse me, Skipper. Priority from Earth. Norton took the message from the sergeant and scanned it quickly just to satisfy himself that it was not immediate. Then he read it again, more slowly. What the devil was the Rama Committee? And why had he never heard of it? Mission Control had done a good job of protection and would not have forwarded this message unless it was considered important. Two hundred kilometer winds. Probably sudden onset. Well, that was something to think about. But it was hard to take it too seriously on this utterly calm night. Norton lifted a hand to brush aside his hair, which had somehow fallen into his eyes again. Then he froze, the gesture uncompleted. He had felt a trace of wind. Several times in the last hour, it was so slight that he'd completely ignored it. Norton stared silently out into the night of Rama. It was no longer unbroken, for at two spots about four kilometers away, the faint patches of exploring parties could be clearly seen. In an emergency, I can recall them within the hour, Norton told himself, and that surely should be good enough. He turned to the sergeant. Take this message. Rama Committee, care of PlanetCom. Appreciate your advice and will take precautions. Please specify meaning of phrase, sudden onset. Respectfully, Norton, Commander, Endeavor. It was not easy to sleep. The darkness and the mysteries it concealed were oppressive, but even more unsettling was the silence. During this night, Norton kept straining his ears into the darkness, and he knew what he was listening for. But though a faint breeze did caress his face from time to time, there was no sound that could possibly be taken for that of a distant rising wind. Not even a hurricane could have created the sound that did wake Norton, and the whole camp, in a single instant. It seemed that the sky was falling, or that Rama had split open and was tearing itself apart. First there was a rending crack, then a long, drawn-out series of crystalline crashes, like a million glass houses being demolished. It lasted for minutes, though it seemed like hours. Eight kilometers overhead, on the axis of Rama, the searchlight began to swing its beam out across the plain. It reached the edge of the sea, then started to track along it, scanning around the interior of the world. A quarter of the way around this cylindrical surface, it stopped. Up there in the sky, or what the mind still persisted in calling the sky, something extraordinary was happening. At first, it seemed to Norton that the sea was boiling. A huge area, kilometers across, was in turbulent movement. It was changing color. A broad bank of white was marching across the ice. Suddenly, a slab, perhaps a quarter of a kilometer on a side, began to tilt upward like an opening door. Slowly and majestically, it reared into the sky, glittering and sparkling in the beam of the searchlight. Then it slid back and vanished beneath the surface, while a tidal wave of foaming water raced outward in all directions. Not until then did Norton fully realize what was happening. The ice was breaking up. The sea was thawing from beneath as the solar heat seeped through the hull of Rama. Day by day, the strain had been building up. Now the bank of ice that encircled the equator of Rama was collapsing, like a bridge that had lost its central pier. It was splintering into hundreds of floating islands, which would crash and jostle into each other until they too melted. The tumult was swiftly subsiding. A temporary stalemate had been reached in the war between ice and water. In a few hours, as the temperature continued to rise, the water would win, and the last vestiges of ice would disappear. But in the long run, ice would be the victor, as Rama rounded the sun and set forth once more into the interstellar night. Spring 
had been a little late, Norton told himself. But winter had ended. And there was that breeze again, stronger than ever. Rama had given him enough warnings. It was time to go. As he neared the halfway mark, Norton once again felt gratitude to the darkness that concealed the view above and below. Though he knew that more than ten thousand steps still lay ahead of him, he could picture the steeply ascending curve in his mind's eye. The fact that he could see only a small portion of it made the prospect more bearable. He felt sick at heart at the failure of his mission, and even now hoped that this was only a temporary retreat. When they reached the hub, they could wait until any atmospheric disturbances had ceased. Presumably there would be a dead calm there, as at the center of a cyclone, and they could wait out the expected storm in safety. Norton had just begun the last vertical kilometer when he realized that something was wrong. The light, shining on the vertical surface immediately in front of his eyes, was the wrong color, and much too bright. Norton did not even have time to check his ascent or to call a warning to his men. Everything happened in less than a second, and a soundless concussion of light, dawn, burst upon Rama. The light was so brilliant that for a full minute Norton had to keep his eyes clenched tightly shut. Then he risked opening them and turned slowly to behold the dawn. He could endure the sight for only a few seconds. Then he was forced to close his eyes again. It was not the glare that was intolerable. He could grow accustomed to that. But the awesome spectacle of Rama, now seen for the first time in its entirety. He took several deep breaths. Then, still keeping his eyes closed, he switched on his radio. He hoped his voice sounded calm and authoritative as he called, Captain here, is everyone okay? As he checked off the names one by one and received answers, even if somewhat tremulous ones from everybody, his own confidence and self-control came swiftly back to him. Keep your eyes closed until you're quite sure you can take it, he called. The view is overwhelming. If anyone finds that it's too much, keep on climbing without looking back. Remember, you'll soon be at zero gravity, so you can't possibly fall. When he felt quite comfortable... He opened his eyes and slowly turned to face Rama. And now he understood the purpose of those mysterious trenches. They were nothing less than gigantic strip lights. Rama had six linear suns symmetrically ranged around its interior. From each, a broad fan of light was aimed across the central axis to shine upon the far side of the world. Who or what had switched on the lights of Rama? By the most sensitive tests that man could apply to it, this world was sterile. But now something was happening that could not be explained by the action of natural forces. There might not be life here, but there could be consciousness, awareness. Robots might be waking after a sleep of eons. With calm determination, Norton began a careful inventory of everything he saw. It seemed most practical to imagine that he was at the bowl-shaped bottom of a gigantic well, sixteen kilometers wide and fifty deep. He could pretend that the scattered towns and cities were all securely fixed to the towering walls, but what was quite unacceptable was the cylindrical sea. There it was, halfway up the well shaft, a band of water wrapped completely around it. There could be no doubt that it was water. It was a vivid blue, flecked with brilliant sparkles from the few remaining ice flows. But a vertical sea forming a complete circle 20 kilometers up in the sky was an unsettling phenomenon. That was when his mind switched the scene through 90 degrees. Instantly, the deep well became a long tunnel, capped at each end. He looked at his chronometer. The pause had lasted only two minutes, but it had seemed a lifetime. Exerting barely enough effort to overcome his inertia and the fading gravitational field, he started to pull himself slowly up the last hundred meters of the ladder. Just before he entered the airlock and turned his back upon Rama, he made one final swift survey of the interior. It had changed. Even in the last few minutes, a mist was rising from the sea. Ghostly white columns started to dissolve in a swirl of turbulence as the uprushing air tried to jettison its excess velocity. The trade winds of this cylindrical world were beginning to etch their patterns in its sky. The first tropical storm in unknown ages was about to break.
It was the first time in weeks that every member of the Rama committee had made himself available. The chairman had fully expected Dr. Pereira to be dogmatically assertive now that his prediction of a Raman hurricane had been confirmed. The exobiologist was, in fact, deeply mortified. The spectacular breakup of the cylindrical sea was a much more obvious phenomenon than the hurricane winds, yet he had completely overlooked it. The return is imperative, said the ambassador from Mercury. We have to learn everything we possibly can about Rama. The situation has now changed completely. Until now, we have assumed that Rama is lifeless, or at any rate uncontrolled. But we can no longer pretend that it is a derelict. Even if there are no life forms aboard, it may be directed by robot mechanisms, programmed to carry out some mission, perhaps one highly disadvantageous to us. Unpalatable though it may be, we must consider the question of self-defense. Where the future of the human race is involved, we can take no chances. Before we know what action to take, we must have the facts. We know the geography of Rama, but we have no idea of its capabilities. And the key to the whole problem is this. Does Rama have a propulsion system? Can it change orbit? I would be very interested in Dr. Pereira's views. I have given the subject a good deal of thought, answered the exobiologist. If it does have onboard propulsion, we found no trace of it. Certainly there are no rocket exhausts or anything similar anywhere on the outer shell. I am reasonably sure of this. If uh, Rama does have a propulsion system, it's something completely outside our present knowledge. In fact, it would have to be the fabulous space drive people have been talking about for 200 years. If we can prove that Rama has a space drive, even if we learn nothing about its mode of operation, that would be a major discovery. What is a space drive? asked the ambassador from Earth. Any kind of propulsion system, Sir Robert, that doesn't work on the rocket principle. Anti-gravity if it is possible, would do very nicely. At present, we do not know where to look for such a drive, and most scientists doubt it exists. It doesn't, Professor Davison interjected. Newton settled that. You can't have an action without reaction. Space drives are nonsense. Take it from me. You may be right, Pereira replied with unusual blandness. The biggest problem would be the water in the cylindrical sea. How would you stop that from... Uh... Pereira's voice faded away. Then he made a sudden recovery. Of course! That explains everything! The higher southern cliff! Now it makes sense! Suppose we do find that Rama is active and has these capabilities. There is an old saying in military affairs that capability does not imply intention. How long should we wait to find what its intentions are? asked the Hermian. When we discover them, it may be far too late. When they re-entered Rama through the final airlock door, Norton was struck first by the change in light. It was no longer harshly blue, but was much more mellow and gentle, reminding him of a bright, hazy day on Earth. The interior of Rama was completely blanketed by clouds, which were lit from within by six artificial suns. The locations of the three on this northern continent were clearly defined by diffuse strips of light, but those on the far side of the cylindrical sea merged together into a continuous glowing band. It seemed appropriate, on this return visit, to use the team that had made the first deep penetration into Rama. Mercer, Calvert, and Myron, that first time, had descended in cold and darkness. Now they were going toward light and warmth. Mercer cracked his mask open a trifle and took a cautious sniff. For the first time at this altitude, the air was perfectly breathable. The musty, dead smell had gone. Humidity was now an astonishing 80%. Doubtless the thawing of the sea was responsible for this. It was like a summer evening, Mercer thought, on some tropical coast. And why? 
the increased humidity was no problem. The startling rise in oxygen was much more difficult to explain. In eerie silence, they continued to glide downward through the fog. It was impossible to tell how far they had traveled, but Calvert guessed that they had almost reached the fourth level when suddenly the cloud ceiling ended as abruptly as it had begun. They shot out into the blinding glare of the Raman day. As far as they could tell, nothing had changed down there on the plain. Mercer was staring thoughtfully at the globe circling band of the cylindrical sea. Have you noticed what's happened to the water? he said. It's no longer so blue, said Myron. I'd call it pea green. Laura called the sea an organic soup, waiting to be shaken into life. Maybe that's exactly what's happened. So that's where the oxygen's come from. Rama shot through the anaerobic stage and has got to photosynthetic plants in about 48 hours. I wonder what it'll produce tomorrow. It was a small raft, constructed from six empty storage drums held together by a light metal framework. We still don't have a name, Skipper. What about it? said Sergeant Barnes. Norton laughed, then became suddenly serious. I've got one for you. Call it Resolution. That was one of Captain Cook's ships. No one thought it in the least peculiar that an executive sergeant was now taking charge of the proceedings. Ruby Barnes had navigated racing trimorans across the Pacific, and it did not seem likely that a few kilometers of dead calm water would present much of a challenge to her skills. Her crew took their places on the improvised bucket seats, and Ruby opened the throttle. The 20-kilowatt motor started to whir, and the chain drives of the reduction gear blurred. As resolution hummed steadily forward, it seemed that they were caught in the trough of a gigantic wave, a wave that curved up on either side until it became vertical, then overhung until the two flanks met in a liquid arch sixteen kilometers above their heads. Despite everything that reason told them, none of the voyagers could for long throw off the impression that at any minute those millions of tons of water would come crashing down from the sky. Yet despite this, Their main feeling was one of exhilaration. The water was now alive. Every spoonful contained thousands of spherical, single-celled microorganisms. And although Laura Ernst, now doubling his research scientist and ship's doctor, had proved that they definitely generated oxygen, there were far too few of them to account for the augmentation of Rama's atmosphere. If you have to swim for it, Dr. Ernst had warned the mariners, keep your mouths closed. A few drops won't matter if you spit them out right away. But all those weird organometallic salts add up to a fairly poisonous package, and I'd hate to have to work out an antidote. After 20 minutes of steady progress, New York was no longer a distant island. It was now strikingly apparent that the city, like so much of Rama, was triplicated. It consisted of three identical circular complexes or superstructures rising from a long oval foundation. The Romans, it seemed, had brought the art of triple redundancy to a high degree of perfection. Norton was the first to step ashore. It was not a city. It was a machine. Norton had come to that conclusion in ten minutes and saw no reason to change it after they'd made a complete traverse of the island. The closest analogy to this place that he had ever seen on Earth was a giant chemical processing plant. However, there were no stockpiles of raw materials or any indications of a transport system to move them around. If this was a factory, he said at last, what did it make? And where did it get its raw materials? The sea was the plausible answer. There could well be buried pipes leading to it. In fact, there must be, for any conceivable chemical plant would require large quantities of water. But he had a suspicion of plausible answers. They were so often wrong. Ravi McAndrews, chief steward, was the last person on the endeavor who would normally get involved in a technical discussion. His IQ was modest, 
and his scientific knowledge was minimal, but he was no fool, and he had a natural shrewdness that everyone respected. Skipper, he said, I believe New York is a factory for making ramens. Somebody somewhere snickered, but became quickly silent and did not identify himself. You know, Ravi, said his commander at last, that theory is crazy enough to be true. This celestial New York was just about as wide as the island of Manhattan, but its geometry was totally different. There were few straight thoroughfares. It was a maze of short, concentric arcs with radial spokes linking them. It was even harder to get used to the silence here than it had been out on the plain of Rama. A city machine should make some sound, yet there was not even the faintest of electric hums or the slightest whisper of mechanical motion. Norton could hear nothing except the pounding of his own blood. The machines were sleeping. Would they ever wake again, and for what purpose? When at last they had reached the far side of the city, they looked across the southern branch of the sea. The five hundred meter cliff barred them from almost half of Rama. From this angle, it appeared an ominous, forbidding black, and it was easy to think of it as a prison wall surrounding a whole continent. Nowhere along its entire circle were there stairways or any other means of access. It was time to return to the mainland. Lieutenant James Pack was the most junior officer on board Endeavour. He was ambitious and due for promotion. He had also committed a serious breach of regulations. It would be a gamble if he lost. He could be in deep trouble. He would not only be risking his career, he might even be risking his neck. But if he succeeded, he would be a hero. What finally convinced him was the certainty that if he did nothing at all, he would spend the rest of his life brooding over his lost opportunity. Nevertheless, he was still hesitant when he asked Commander Norton for a private meeting. I have an idea, Commander. I know how to reach the southern continent, even the South Pole. I'm listening. How do you propose to do it? Um, by flying there. You know, Commander, that I was in the Lunar Olympics last year. Well, of course. <laughs> Sorry you didn't win. Now, it was bad equipment, and I know what went wrong. Now, I have friends on Mars who've been working on it. The best aerodynamicists in the solar system are on Mars. If you can fly in that atmosphere, you can fly anywhere. Imagine a fully aerobatic flyer in lunar gravity under the Olympic Dome. It should create a sensation. Well, let me see if I follow your train of thought correctly. A sky bike that could enter the lunar Olympics at a sixth of a gravity would be even more sensational than inside Rama, with no gravity at all. You could fly it right along the axis, from the North Pole to the South, and back again. Yes, easily. The one-way trip would take three hours, non-stop. But of course you could rest whenever you wanted to, as long as you kept near the axis. All right, Jimmy. Now, purely off the record, how did you smuggle the thing aboard? Uh, recreational stores. It's only 20 kilograms. Some have been only 15, but they were too fragile and usually folded up when they made a turn. There's no danger a dragonfly doing that. As I said, she's fully aerobatic. Dragonfly. <laughs> nice name. So tell me just how do you plan to use her? Then I can decide whether a promotion or a court-martial is in order. Or both. Dragonfly was certainly a good name. The long, tapering wings were almost invisible, except when the light struck them from certain angles and was refracted into rainbow hues. It was as if a soap bubble had been wrapped around a delicate tracery of aerofoil sections. The pilot, who was also the power plant and the guidance system, sat on a tiny seat at the center of gravity in a semi-reclining position to reduce air resistance. Control was by a single stick. Jimmy tested the controls and started to move the foot pedals. The flimsy, broad fan of the air screw, like the wing, a delicate skeleton covered with shimmering film, began to turn. By the time it had made a few revolutions, it had disappeared completely, and Dragonfly was on her way. She lifted straight upward, or outward, from the hub, moving slowly along the axis of Rama. As long as he stayed precisely on the axis, he and Dragonfly would be completely weightless. He could hover effortlessly, 
or even go to sleep if he wished. But as soon as he moved away from the central line around which Rama spun, the pseudo-weight of the centrifugal force would reappear. He would lose height and, at the same time, gain weight. It would be an accelerating process which could end in catastrophe. The real magnitude of his adventure did not hit Jimmy Pack until he reached the coast of the cylindrical sea. Until now, he had been over known territory. Barring a catastrophic structural failure, he could always land and walk back to base in a few hours. That option no longer existed. If he came down in the sea, he would probably drown, quite unpleasantly, in its poisonous waters. And even if he made a safe landing on the southern continent, it might be impossible to rescue him before Endeavor had to break away from Rama's sunward orbit. Yet, if there were no hazards, there would be no achievement, no sense of adventure. Dragonfly, said Hub Control. You're getting a little low. 2,200 meters from the axis. Thanks, he replied. I'll gain altitude. When he reached New York, he flew a circle over it, stopping several times so that his little TV camera could send back steady, vibration-free images. After leaving the island of New York, Jimmy crossed the other half of the sea in only 15 minutes. From above the great cliff that formed the sea's southern limit, he panned the TV camera completely around the circle of the world. Beautiful, said Hub Control. This will keep the map makers happy. How are you feeling? I'm fine. Just a little fatigue, but no more than I expected. Twenty minutes later, the world was closing in upon him. He had come to the end of the cylindrical section and was entering the southern dome. In almost every way, the southern and northern ends of Rama differed completely. Here was no triad of stairways, no series of narrow concentric plateaus, no sweeping curve from hub to plain. Instead, there was an immense central spike more than five kilometers long, extending along the axis. Six smaller ones, half the size, were equally spaced around it. The whole assembly looked like the spires of some Cambodian temple set at the bottom of a crater. Jimmy approached the central spike cautiously, stopped pedaling while he was still a hundred meters away, and let Dragonfly drift to rest. What can you see? Hub Control asked anxiously. Just bighorn. It's absolutely smooth, no markings, and the point's so sharp you could use it as a needle. I, I'm almost scared to go near it. He was only half joking. Jimmy, this is Norton. We'd like you to fly along the spike, making a complete scan every half kilometer and looking out for anything unusual. And judging by your pictures, the smaller spikes are just the same as the big one. Uh, get the best coverage of them you can with the zoom lens. I don't want you leaving the low-gravity region unless you see something that looks very important. Then we'll talk it over. Okay, Skipper, said Jimmy. He pedaled on, feeling he was dropping straight downward into a narrow valley between a group of incredibly tall and slender mountains. Bighorn now towered a kilometer above him, and the six spikes of the little horns were looming up all around. As he came ever closer to the South Pole, he began to feel more and more like a sparrow flying beneath the vaulted roof of some great cathedral. He felt an urgent need to resume human contact and swung Dragonfly around in a wide circle. As Jimmy turned homeward, the northern end of Rama seemed incredibly far away, but he had come all this way with no problems, and though he was feeling slightly tired, he now felt that he had nothing to worry about. He had almost reached the tip of Bighorn when he became aware of a curious sensation, a feeling of foreboding. At first he shrugged it off and continued his steady pedaling. He certainly had no intention of reporting anything as tenuous as a vague malaise to hub control. But as it grew steadily worse, he was tempted to do so. He could, quite literally, feel his skin beginning to crawl. Now, seriously alarmed, he stopped in midair to consider the situation. Something was tickling the back of his hand. For a moment, he thought an insect had landed there, and he lifted his hand and stared at it. It was then that he noticed that every individual hair was standing straight upright. So that was the trouble. He was in a tremendously powerful electric field. The oppressed, heavy sensation he had felt was that which sometimes precedes a thunderstorm on Earth. The sudden realization of his predicament brought Jimmy near to panic. There was no quick way out. He felt naked and alone in a suddenly hostile sky, surrounded by titanic forces that might discharge their furies at any moment. 
Hub control, he said urgently. There's a static charge building up around me. I think there's going to be a thunderstorm. He'd barely finished speaking when there was a flicker of light behind him. By the time he'd counted ten, the first crackling rumble arrived. Three kilometers. That put it back around the little horns. He'd looked toward them and saw that every one of the six needles seemed to be on fire. Brush discharges, hundreds of meters long, were dancing from their points as if they were giant lightning conductors. What was happening back there could take place on an even larger scale near the tapering spike of Bighorn. His best move would be to get as far as possible from this dangerous structure and to see clear air. He started to pedal again, accelerating as swiftly as he could without putting too great a strain on Dragonfly. The thunder reverberated behind him, rolling round and round the circumference of the world. He was well past the tip of Bighorn and hoped that he would soon be beyond the range of any lightning discharges. But now he had another problem. The air was becoming turbulent and he had difficulty controlling Dragonfly. He pedaled grimly on, but he did not like the faint creaks of protest that came from the main spar or the way the wings twisted with every gust. There was a faint rushing sound that seemed to come from the direction of Bighorn. It sounded like gas escaping from a valve under great pressure, and he wondered if it had anything to do with the increasing turbulence he was battling. He felt almost as if he was entering a jet stream. But what could possibly create a jet stream inside Rama? He'd asked himself the right question. As soon as he had formulated it, he knew the answer. The sound he had heard was the electric wind carrying away the tremendous ionization that must be building up around Bighorn. Charged air was spraying out along the axis of Rama, and more air was flowing into the low pressure region behind. He looked back at the gigantic and now doubly threatening needle. A sheet of flame burst out behind him, filling the sky. He had time to see it split into six ribbons of fire stretching from the tip of Bighorn to each of the little horns. Then the concussion reached him. When Jimmy returned to consciousness, the first thing he became aware of was a splitting headache. He almost welcomed it. At least it proved that he was alive. He was still lying there, regaining his strength and wondering how soon it would be safe to open his eyes when there was a sudden crunching noise from close at hand. Not more than five meters away, a large, crab-like creature was apparently dining on the wreckage of poor Dragonfly. When Jimmy had recovered his wits, he rolled slowly and quietly away from the monster. From ten meters away, the thing did not appear quite so formidable. It had a low, flat body, about two meters long and one wide, supported on six triple-jointed legs. Jimmy saw that he was mistaken in assuming that it had been eating Dragonfly. In fact, he could not see any sign of a mouth. The creature was actually doing a neat job of demolition, using scissor-like claws to chop the sky bike into small pieces. A whole row of manipulators, which looked uncannily like tiny human hands, then transferred the fragments to a steadily growing pile on the animal's back. Keeping a wary eye on the crab, Jimmy struggled to his feet. Then he switched on his radio. Up control, he said softly. Can you receive me? Oh, thank God. Are you okay? <laughs> Just a bit shaken. Take a look at this. He turned his camera toward the crab, just in time to record the final demolition of Dragonfly's wing. The crab was now moving round and round in a steadily widening spiral, apparently searching for fragments it might have overlooked, and so Jimmy was able to get an overall view of it for the first time. He might have called it a beetle. Its carapace had a beautiful metallic sheen. That was an interesting idea. Could it be a robot? and not an animal? He stared at the crab intently. The eyes were so deeply recessed in protective hoods that it was impossible to tell whether their lenses were made of crystal or of jelly. Though they had been directed toward Jimmy several times, they had never shown the slightest flicker of interest. It had stopped its circling and stood still for a few seconds. Then it set off in the general direction of the sea, with the last sad relics of Jimmy's beloved dragonfly. He set off in hot and indignant pursuit. Because he was bruised and stiff, it took Jimmy several minutes to catch up with a purposefully moving crab. He followed it to the edge of a yawning, one half kilometer wide pit. It was one of three in the southern hemisphere which were situated on the cliff above the cylindrical sea. 
When he came close enough to look into it, Jimmy was able to see a pool of ominous leaden green water at least half a kilometer below. This would put it just about level with the sea, and he wondered if they were connected. The crab gave a brisk shrug. The fragments of dragonfly went fluttering down into the depths. So much, Jimmy thought bitterly, for this creature's intelligence. Having disposed of the garbage, the crab swung around and, ignoring Jimmy completely, walked straight past him and headed purposefully into the south. Feeling rather foolish, the acting representative of Homo sapiens watched his first contact stride away across the Raman plain, totally indifferent to his presence. Then his sense of humor came to the rescue. After all, it was no great matter to have been ignored by an animated garbage truck. It would have been worse if it had greeted him as a long lost brother. Commander Norton had never yet lost a man, and he had no intention of losing one now. Even before Jimmy had set off for the South Pole, he'd been considering ways of rescuing him in the event of accident. The problem had turned out to be so difficult, however, that he'd found no answer. At fleet headquarters, many suggested solutions were considered, and about one in a thousand was forwarded to Endeavor, including Dr. Carlisle Pereira's. It had taken the scientist approximately five minutes of thought and one millisecond of computer time. At first, Norton thought it was a joke in very poor taste. Then he saw the sender's name and the attached calculations and did a quick double take. Though he could look across the full width of the cylindrical sea and knew the general direction from which resolution was coming, Jimmy did not spot the tiny craft until it had already passed New York. When it was only a kilometer away, he recognized Commander Norton and started waving. Jimmy thought the commander would not have crossed the sea just to say goodbye. He must have worked out something. Resolution came to a halt, fifty meters out and five hundred below. Jimmy had almost a bird's eye view of the commander as he spoke into his microphone. This is it, Jimmy. You'll be perfectly safe, but it will require nerve. We know you got plenty of that. You're going to jump. Five hundred meters? Shut up, or I'll cancel your next leave. You should have worked this out for yourself. Now, it's just a question of terminal velocity. In this atmosphere, you can't reach more than ninety kilometers an hour, whether you fall two hundred or two thousand meters. Ninety's a little high for comfort, but we can trim it some more. This is what you'll have to do. So listen carefully. Jimmy did not interrupt the commander again and made no comment when Norton had finished. Yes. It made sense, and was so absurdly simple that it would take a genius to think of it, and perhaps someone who did not expect to do it himself. Now Jimmy understood why he had been given no time to brood or to think of objections. Jimmy stripped off his shirt and stretched it thoughtfully. Several times on his trek, he had almost discarded it. Now it might help to save his life. For the last time, he looked back at the hollow world he alone had explored, and the distant ominous pinnacles of the Big and Little Horns. Then, grasping the shirt firmly with his right hand, he took a running jump as far out over the cliff as he could. Holding his shirt with both hands, he stretched his arms above his head so that the rushing air filled the garment and blew it into a hollow tube. As a parachute, it was hardly a success. The few kilometers an hour it subtracted from his speed were useful, but not vital. It was doing a much more important job, keeping his body vertical so that he would arrow straight into the sea. He had the impression that he was not moving at all, but that the water below was rushing up toward him. At the last moment, he let go of his shirt, took a deep breath, and grabbed his mouth and nose with his hands. As he had been instructed, he stiffened his body into a rigid bar and locked his feet together. Something slapped him across the feet, hard but not viciously. A million slimy hands were tearing at his body. There was a roaring in his ears, a mounting pressure, and even though his eyes were tightly closed, he could tell that darkness was falling as he arrowed down into the depths of the cylindrical sea. With all his strength, he started to swim upward toward the fading light. He could not open his eyes for more than a single blink. The poisonous water felt like acid when he did so. He seemed to have been struggling for ages when he broke water. He gulped a precious mouthful of air, rolled over on his back, and looked around.
Resolution was heading toward him at top speed. Within seconds, eager hands had grabbed him and dragged him aboard. Jimmy was still regaining his breath when there was a flicker of light in the sky behind him. All eyes turned toward the South Pole. The horns had started their fireworks display again. There were the kilometer-long streamers of fire dancing from the central spike to its smaller companions, as if invisible dancers were winding their ribbons around an electric maypole. But now they began to accelerate, moving faster and faster, until they blurred into a flickering cone of light. It was a spectacle more awe-inspiring than any they had yet seen here, and it brought with it a distant, crackling roar, which added to the impression of overwhelming power. The display lasted for about five minutes, then it stopped as abruptly as if someone had turned a switch. At that moment, Hub Control called in great excitement. Resolution, are you okay? We think we just felt an earthquake. It must have happened the minute those fireworks stopped. Anyway, everything seems quiet now. My God, Norton whispered slowly. And then to hub control called, We're on our way. So, it's beginning to happen, Norton said to himself. And a lot earlier than we expected. We're still a long way from perihelion and the logical time for Rama's orbit change but some kind of trim was undoubtedly taking place. Soon, resolution drew up at the landing stage, and the crew stepped thankfully ashore. From now on, Norton had decreed, there would always be at least three people at Camp Alpha, and one of them would always be awake to eliminate any possibility of surprise. It was a good plan, and it failed completely. Norton, Rodrigo, Calvert, and Laura Ernst were watching the regular evening news telecast beam specially to them from the transmitter at Inferno Mercury when they discovered an intruder in the camp. Laura Ernst noticed it first. Ten meters away was a slender-legged tripod surmounted by a spherical body no larger than a soccer ball. Set around the body were three large, expressionless eyes, apparently giving 360 degrees of vision, and trailing beneath it were three whip-like tendrils. The creature was not quite as tall as a man, and looked far too fragile to be dangerous. But that did not excuse their carelessness in letting it sneak up on them unawares. It reminded Norton of nothing so much as a three-legged spider or daddy longlings, and he wondered how it had solved the problem, never attempted by any creature on earth, of tripedal locomotion. After regarding them impassively for several minutes, the creature suddenly moved, and now they could understand why they had failed to observe its arrival. It was fast. As far as Norton could judge, and only a high-speed camera could settle the matter, each leg in turn acted as a pivot around which the creature whirled its body. It also seemed to him that every few steps it reversed its direction of spin. Its top speed seemed to be at least 30 kilometers an hour. It swept swiftly around the camp, examining every item of equipment. There seemed to be nothing that it ignored except the four watchers. I wish I could examine it, Laura exclaimed in frustration as the creature continued its swift pirouette. Within a few hours there were hundreds of the spiders. They appeared to be everywhere. But they never visited the same place twice. Norton frequently had the impression that they were searching for something. They went all the way up to the central hub, scorning the three great stairways. How they managed to ascend the vertical sections, even under almost zero gravity, was not clear. Laura theorized that they were equipped with suction pans. And then, to her obvious delight, she got her eagerly desired specimen. Hub Control reported that a spider had fallen down the vertical face and was lying, dead or incapacitated, on the first platform. As soon as Laura got her prize back to the Endeavor, she started to work with her dissecting kit. The blade went in with practically no resistance. A second later, Surgeon Commander Ernst's most unladylike yell echoed the length and breadth of Endeavor. As you are all aware, gentlemen, said the Martian ambassador, a great deal has happened since our last meeting. 
We have much to discuss and to decide. I am therefore particularly sorry that our distinguished colleague from Mercury is not here. The last statement was not altogether accurate. Dr. Bose was not particularly sorry that His Excellency the Hermian Ambassador was absent. It would have been much more truthful to say that he was worried. The Ambassador's letter of apology had been courteous and entirely uncommunicative. His Excellency had regretted that urgent and unavoidable business had kept him from attending the meeting. Pereira was getting impatient. Normally, the exobiologist was as happy as anyone else to engage in speculation. But now, with Surgeon Commander Ernst's report on the spider dissection, he had some solid facts. His long, impoverished science had become wealthy overnight. The spider is definitely organic, yet I hesitate to call it an animal. In the first place, it seems to have no mouth, no method of ingesting food. Also, no air intakes, no blood, no reproductive system. You may wonder what it has got. Well, uh, there is a simple musculature, controlling its three legs and the three whip-like tendrils or feelers. There is a brain, fairly complex, mostly concerned with the creature's remarkably developed triocular vision. But 80% of the body consists of a honeycomb of large cells, and this is what gave Dr. Ernst such an unpleasant surprise when she started her dissection. Most of the spider is simply a battery, much like that found in electric eels. But in this case, it's apparently not used for defense. It's the creature's source of energy, and that is why it has no provisions for eating and breathing. So, we have a creature which is nothing more than a reconnaissance device. All the spiders ever do is run around and look at things. That's all they can do. But the other animals are different. The crab, the starfish, these can obviously manipulate their environment and appear to be specialized for various functions. Could such creatures evolve naturally? I really don't think so. They appear to be designed like machines for specific jobs. I would say that they are biological robots, something that has no analogy on Earth. If Rama is a spaceship, perhaps they are part of its crew. And if Commander Norton and his men can wait long enough, they may meet the Ramans themselves, the real makers of this world. And when that happens, gentlemen, there will be no doubt about it at all. Commander Norton was sleeping soundly when his personal communicator dragged him away from happy dreams. Sorry to wake you, Skipper, said Kirchhoff. Triple A priority from headquarters. It's in code. Commander's eyes only. Norton was instantly awake. He had received such a message only three times in his whole career, and on each occasion it had meant trouble. Norton read the message. Space Survey HQ to Commander SSS Endeavor. Priority Triple A. Classification, your eyes only. Space Guard reports ultra-high-speed vehicle apparently launched Mercury 10 to 12 days ago on Rama Intercept. If no orbit change, arrival predicted date 322 days, 15 hours. May be necessary you evacuate before then. Will advise further, CNC. It was now day 315. That might leave them only one week. The message was chilling, not only for what it said, but also for what it implied. The Hermians had made a clandestine launch, which in itself was a breach of space law. The conclusion was obvious. Their vehicle could only be a missile. The missile was still five million kilometers away when its plasma braking jets became visible in Endeavour's main telescope. By that time, the secret was out, and Norton had reluctantly ordered the second and perhaps final evacuation of Rama. It had been three days since the missile's existence and origin had been announced. All that time, the Hermians had remained stubbornly silent. 
triple-A message from Earth, Skipper, said the bridge. Voice and backup text from Commander-in-Chief. C in C, Commander Endeavor. We've analyzed the photos you've sent us. The size and mass are consistent with fusion bomb in the 500 to 1,000 megaton range. Our experts estimate that this would be the minimum size necessary to assure destruction of Rama. If it was detonated against the thinnest part of the shell, underneath the cylindrical C, the hull would be ruptured, and the spin of the body would complete its disintegration. We assume that the Hermians, if they are planning such an act, will give you ample time to get clear. The fragments of Rama, weighing tons and spinning off at almost a thousand kilometers an hour, could destroy you. We therefore recommend that you proceed along the spin axis, since no fragments will be thrown off in that direction. Your reply may not be secure, so speak with discretion and use code when necessary. I will call you immediately after the General Assembly discussion at 1400. A message concluded. CNC out. <laughs> According to the history books, though no one could really believe it, there had been a time when the old United Nations had 172 members. The United Planets had only seven, and that was sometimes bad enough. In order of distance from the Sun, there were Mercury, Earth, Luna, Mars, Ganymede, Titan, and Triton. The delegates were arranged counterclockwise in this order, with the Hermian ambassador on the President's extreme right. We recognize His Excellency, the Ambassador from Mercury. The Hermian rose briskly to his feet. Mr. President, distinguished fellow delegates, when Roman's true nature was discovered, the solar survey vessel Endeavour was ordered to rendezvous with it. I am sure we will all want to congratulate Commander Norton and his crew for the efficient way in which they have carried out their unique assignment. At first, it was believed that Rama was dead, frozen for so many hundreds of thousands of years that there was no possibility of revival. It therefore appeared that, although Rama was of enormous archaeological importance, it did not present any major astro-political problems. It is now obvious that this was a very naive attitude, though even from the first there were some who pointed out that Rama was too precisely aimed at the sun for pure chance to be involved. Rama has now given proof that its propulsion system is still operating. In a few days it will be at perihelion, where it would logically make any major orbit change. We are therefore, fellow delegates, faced with a whole spectrum of possibilities, some of them very serious indeed. It is foolish to pretend that these creatures must be benevolent and will not interfere with us in any way. If they come to our solar system, they need something from it. With this in mind, consider now the appalling threat that Rama may, I do not say must, present to human civilization. What steps have we taken to counter it, if the worst should occur? None whatsoever. We have merely talked and speculated and written learned papers. We, my fellow delegates, Mercury has done more than this. Acting under the provisions of Clause 34 of the Space Treaty of 2057, which entitles us to take any steps necessary to protect the integrity of our solar space, we have dispatched a high-energy nuclear device to Rama. We will indeed be happy if we never have to utilize it, but... Now, at least we are not helpless, as we were before. That is all, Mr. President. Fellow delegates, I thank you for your attention. I look forward to your cooperation. Commander Norton, said Lieutenant Rodrigo with a humorless smile, it's the age-old conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and there are times when men have to take sides in such a conflict. I take it you have a plan, Norton replied. Yes, Commander. It's really quite simple. We merely have to disable the bomb. <laughs> and how do you propose to do that? With a small pair of wire cutters. If this had been anyone else, Norton would have assumed that he was joking. 
but not Rodrigo. Now, just a minute. It's bristling with cameras. Do you suppose the Hermians will just sit and watch you? Of course. That's all they can do. When the signal reaches them, it will be far too late. I can easily finish the job in ten minutes. Norton could see that Rodrigo had thought this through completely. The idea was fascinating. Almost seductive in its appeal. He particularly liked the idea of the frustrated Hermians. He was facing by far the most difficult and the most crucial decision of his or any commander's entire career. When Rodrigo had left, Norton switched on the Do Not Disturb sign. He could choose to do nothing and wait until the Hermians advised him to leave. But he would not care to be remembered forever as the accessory to a cosmic crime that it had been in his power to prevent. And the plan was flawless. The time had come to listen to his inner voices. He whispered, The human race has to live with its conscience. Whatever the Hermians argue, survival is not everything. He pressed the call button for the bridge circuit and said slowly, Lieutenant Rodrigo, I'd like to see you. The scooter could accelerate at over a third of gravity and could make the trip from Endeavor to the bomb in four minutes. That left six to spare. It should be sufficient. Rodrigo looked back only once when he'd left the ship. He drifted over the curving rim of the world. And there was the missile, glittering in sunlight fiercer even than that shining on the planet of its birth. Now he initiated the sequence. At first, the sensation of weight seemed crushing. Then Rodrigo adjusted to it. One hundred seconds into the mission, he was approaching the halfway point. The bomb was too far away to show any details, but it was much brighter against the jet black sky. At two minutes, ten seconds, he was decelerating at the rate of three meters per second squared. The bomb was twenty-five kilometers away. He would be there in another two minutes. Now he could see the main antenna, holding steady on the invisible star of Mercury. Along that beam, the image of his approaching scooter had been flashing at the speed of light for the last three minutes. What would the Hermians do when they saw him? As the scooter closed in across the last few hundred meters, Rodrigo quickly matched the details he could now see with those he had studied in the photographs taken at long range. The bomb was a cylinder about ten meters long and three in diameter. It was attached to the framework of the carrier vehicle by an open latticework of short I-beams. From each end of the bomb, a bundle of braided cables ran along the cylindrical side and disappeared into the interior of the vehicle. All communication and control was here. He glanced at his watch. It would be another thirty seconds before the Hermians, even if they had been watching when he rounded the edge of Rama, could know of his existence. He had an absolutely certain five minutes for uninterrupted work. Rodrigo grappled the scooter to the missile framework. He'd already chosen his tools and was out of the pilot's seat at once. The heavy wire cutters made short work of the cable. He glanced again at his watch. This had taken less than a minute, which meant that he was on schedule. Now for the backup cable, and then he could head for home, in full view of the furious and frustrated Hermians. He was just beginning to work on the second cable assembly when he felt a faint vibration in the metal he was touching. Startled, he looked back along the body of the missile. The characteristic blue-violet glow of a plasma thruster in action was hovering around one of the attitude control jets. The bomb was preparing to move. Rodrigo's first sensation was not one of physical fear. It was something much more devastating. No message could travel faster than light. He was five minutes ahead of anything that Mercury could do. This could only be a coincidence. By chance, a control signal must have been sent to the bomb at about the time he was leaving Endeavor. The second thruster started to fire, checking the spin given by the first. The bomb was reorientating itself to point toward Rama. Rodrigo glanced at his watch, though by now he was almost aware of the time without having to check. The second set of cables went as easily as the first. The bomb could no longer be detonated by remote command. Yet there was one other possibility. There were no external contact fuses, but there might be internal ones that would be armed by the shock of impact. The Hermians still had control over their vehicle's movement, and so could crash it into Rama whenever they wished. Rodrigo's work was not yet finished. 
He reached the mounting of the long-range antenna and drifted hand over hand along it to the big dish. His faithful cutters made short work of the multiplex feed system, chewing up cables and laser waveguides alike. When he made the last snip, the antenna started to swing around. The unexpected movement took him by surprise until he realized that he had destroyed its automatic lock on Mercury. Just five minutes from now, the Hermians would lose all contact with their servant. Not only was it impotent, now it was blind and deaf. Norton knew this would be the last trip into Rama. The hull was already developing dangerous hot spots. A final plan had taken shape. If we try it, said Carl Mercer, do you think the biots will stop us? They may. That's one of the things I want to find out. Norton paused. The deserted streets of London seemed full of menace, though he was quite certain that this whole complex, like all the other towns, was merely some kind of storage area. Those without goggles, turn your backs, ordered Willard Myron. There was a smell of nitric oxides as the air itself started to burn in the beam of the laser torch. Nothing material could resist this concentration of power. In a remarkably short time, a section large enough to admit a man had been sliced out. Once again, as he had done during that first entrance into Rama, Norton remembered the archaeologist who had opened the old Egyptian tomb. He did not expect to see the glitter of gold. In fact, he had no preconceived ideas at all as he crawled through the opening, his flashlight held in front of him. A Greek temple made of glass. That was his first impression. The building was filled with row upon row of vertical crystalline columns, about a meter wide and stretching from floor to ceiling. There were hundreds of them marching away into the darkness beyond the reach of his light. As he walked toward the nearest column and directed his beam into its interior, he heard an exclamation of surprise from Mercer. Can't you see it? said Mercer incredulously. Come around to this side. Damn, I now I've lost it. The columns were not transparent from every angle or under all illuminations. As one walked around them, objects would suddenly flash into view, apparently embedded in their depths like flies in amber, and would then disappear again. There were dozens of them, all different. They looked absolutely real and solid, yet many seemed to occupy the identical volume of space. Holograms, said Calvert. Just like a museum on Earth. Hand tools, though for huge and peculiar hands. Containers, small machines with keyboards that appeared to have been made for more than five fingers. Scientific instruments, startlingly conventional domestic utensils, including knives and plates. They were all there, with hundreds of less identifiable objects, often jumbled up together in the same pillar. The sheer variety of items gave Norton a clue. This may be an indexed catalog for 3D images templates, solid blueprints, if you like to call them that. You know the theory about the biots, the idea that they don't exist until they're needed and then they're created, synthesized from patterns stored somewhere? To increase their rate of coverage, the four explorers had now spread out through the crystal columns. Skipper! Carl! Will! Look at this! Calvert was prone to sudden enthusiasms, but what he had found now was enough to justify any amount of excitement. Inside one of the two-meter columns was an elaborate harness, or uniform, obviously made for a vertically standing creature much taller than a man. A very narrow central metal band apparently surrounded the waist, thorax, or some division unknown to terrestrial zoology. From this rose three slim columns, tapering outward and ending in a perfectly circular belt, an impressive meter in diameter. Loops, equally spaced along it, could be intended only to go around upper limbs or arms. Three of them. The whole arrangement was almost as complex as a spacesuit, though it obviously provided only partial covering for the creature wearing it. And was that creature a Raman? Norton asked himself. We'll probably never know. They were standing there, unable to drag themselves away when Rousseau called from the hub, his voice full of urgent concern. Skipper, you better get outside. The lights are going out. When he hastily emerged from the hole they had lasered, 
It seemed to Norton that the six sons of Rama were as brilliant as ever. But Rousseau's meter reading had confirmed a 40% drop in light level. This is it, Norton said grimly. We're going home. Leave all the equipment behind. We won't need it again. The first tremor came when they had almost reached the stairway. Bridge! Norton called. Did you notice that? Yes, Skipper. Very small shock. Could be another attitude change. Uh, just a minute. Positive reading. So Rama was beginning to turn. Those earlier shocks might have been a false alarm, but this surely was the real thing. This, Norton was grimly aware, would be the longest and most nerve-wracking climb they had ever made. After an hour's steady plodding, they had reached the fourth section of the stairway, about three kilometers from the plane. From now on, it would be much easier. Gravity was already down to a third of Earth value. Brilliant beads, like ball lightning, raced along the six narrow valleys that had once illuminated this world. They moved from both poles toward the sea in a synchronized hypnotic rhythm that could have only one meaning. To the sea, the lights were calling. To the sea. And the summons was hard to resist. There was not a man who did not feel a compulsion to turn back and to seek oblivion in the waters of Rama. Up control, Norton called urgently. Can you see what's happening? The voice of Rousseau came back to him. He sounded awed and more than a little frightened. Yes, Skipper. I'm looking across at the southern hemisphere. There are scores of biots over there, including some big ones, lots of scavengers. And they're all rushing back to the sea faster than I've ever seen them move before. There goes one, right over the edge. Rama was battening down the hatches like a ship preparing for a storm. That was Norton's overwhelming impression, though he could not have put it on a logical basis. One more section of stairway, another ten-minute pause to let the fatigue poisons drain from his muscles. Then on again, another two kilometers to go, but better not to think about that. The maddening sequence of descending whistles abruptly ceased. At the same moment, the fireballs racing along the slots of the straight valleys stopped their seaward strobing. Rama's sons were once more continuous bands of light, but they were fading fast. Lifetimes later, the slow trek up the stairway ended. Only a few meters of vertical, recessed ladder were left. Norton almost forgot his knotted muscles as he had his last view of Rama. New York, London, Paris, Moscow, Rome. A hundred kilometers was an adequate safety margin, Norton had decided. Rama was now a huge black rectangle, exactly broadside on, eclipsing the sun. So now we have to wait, Norton told himself. The important thing is to be ready to react at a moment's notice, to keep all the instruments aligned and recording, no matter how long it takes. Skipper, said Calvert urgently from the nav position. We're rolling. Look at the stars. But I'm getting no instrument readings. When all else failed, a man had to rely on eyeball instrumentation. Norton could not doubt that the star field was indeed slowly rotating. There went Sirius, across the rim of the port. Either the universe had suddenly decided to revolve around Endeavor, or the stars were standing still and the ship was turning. The second explanation seemed rather more likely. Yet if the ship was really turning at this rate, he would have felt it. And the gyros could not all have failed, simultaneously and independently. Only one answer remained. Every atom of endeavor must be in the grip of some force, and only a powerful gravitational field could produce this effect. At least, no other known field could. Suddenly, the stars vanished. The blazing disk of the sun had emerged from behind the shield of Rama, and its glare had driven them from the sky. Rama was underway at last. And Endeavor was somehow caught in its wake, like a piece of flotsam whirling round and round behind a speeding ship. Hour after hour, that acceleration held constant. Rama was falling away from Endeavor at steadily increasing speed. As the distance grew, the anomalous behavior of the ship slowly ceased. The normal laws of inertia started to operate again. They could only guess at the energies in whose backlash they had been briefly caught. As to the nature of Rama's drive. There were no jets of gas, no beams of ions or plasma thrusting Rama into its new orbit. No one put it better than Sergeant Professor Myron when he said, in shocked disbelief, "There goes Newton's third law."
It was Newton's third law, however, upon which Endeavour had to depend the next day, when she used her very last reserves of propellant to bend her own orbit outward from the sun. The change was slight, but it would increase her perihelion distance by ten million kilometers. That was the difference between running the ship's cooling system at ninety-five percent capacity and a certain fiery death. When they had completed their own maneuver. Rama was two hundred thousand kilometers away and difficult to see against the glare of the sun. But they could obtain radar measurements of its orbit, and the more they observed, the more puzzled they became. It was hard to see how Rama could possibly escape disaster. At perihelion, it would be less than half a million kilometers above that inferno of fusing hydrogen. No solid material could withstand the temperature of such an approach. Then. Five million kilometers from the sun, and still accelerating, Rama started to spin its cocoon. Until now, it had been visible under the maximum power of Endeavour's telescopes as a tiny bright bar. Suddenly, it began to scintillate. It almost seemed as if it was disintegrating. When he saw the image breaking up, Norton felt a poignant sense of grief at the loss of so much wonder. Then he realized that Rama was still there, but that it was surrounded by a shimmering haze. And then it was gone. In its place was a brilliant, star-like object, showing no visible disk, as if Rama had contracted into a tiny ball. It was some time before they figured out what had happened. Rama had indeed disappeared. It was now surrounded by a perfectly reflecting sphere, about a hundred kilometers in diameter. All that they could now see was the reflection of the sun itself on the curved portion that was closest to them. Behind this protective bubble, Rama was presumably safe from the solar inferno. Then the first anomalous reports started coming in from the robot observatories, which for almost two hundred years had been keeping a permanent watch on the sun. Something was happening to the solar magnetic field in the region around Rama. The million-kilometer-long lines of force that threaded the corona were shaping themselves around that glittering ellipsoid. And presently, even the eye could see the changes in the corona. A faintly glowing tube or tunnel, a hundred thousand kilometers long, had appeared high in the outer atmosphere of the sun. It was slightly curved, bending along the orbit Rama was tracing, and Rama's protective cocoon was visible as a glittering bead racing faster and faster down that ghostly tube through the corona. Now there was no question of its ever remaining a captive of the sun. At last, the Raman strategy was obvious. They had come so close to the sun merely to tap its energy at the source and to speed themselves on the way to their ultimate, unknown goal. Faster and faster, Rama swept round the sun, moving more swiftly than any object that had ever travelled through the solar system. In less than two hours, its direction of motion had swung through more than ninety degrees. And it had given a final, almost contemptuous proof of its total lack of interest in all the worlds whose peace of mind it had so rudely disturbed. It was dropping out of the ecliptic, down into the southern sky, far below the plane in which all the planets move. Though that surely could not be its ultimate goal, it was aimed squarely at the greater Magellanic cloud and the lonely gulfs beyond the Milky Way. Come in," said Commander Norton absent-mindedly, at the quiet knock on his door. "Some news for you, Bill." Norton still seemed far away. He blinked once or twice and was suddenly back in his body. "Sorry, Laura. What's it all about?" Surgeon Commander Ernst sat down beside him. Though interplanetary crises come and go, the wheels of Martian bureaucracy grind steadily away. But I suppose Rama helped. Good thing you didn't have to get permission from the Hermians as well. Light was dawning. Oh, Port Lowell has issued the permit," said Norton. Better than that, it's already being acted on. Laura glanced at the slip of paper in her hand. Immediate, she read. Probably right now your new son is being conceived. Congratulations. Thank you. I hope he hasn't minded the wait. Like every astronaut. Norton had been sterilized when he entered the service. For a man who had spent years in space, radiation-induced mutation was not a risk; it was a certainty. 
The spermatozoon that had just delivered its cargo of genes on Mars had been frozen for thirty years, awaiting its moment of destiny. Norton wondered if he would be home in time for the birth. This visit, protested Laura rather feebly, was purely in a professional capacity. After all these years, replied Norton, we know each other better than that. Anyway, you're off duty now. This situation, he knew, was doubtless being repeated throughout the ship. Even though they were weeks from home, the end of mission orbital orgy would be in full swing. Now, what are you thinking? demanded Laura much later. You're not becoming sentimental, I hope. Not about us. About Rama. I'm beginning to miss it. Thanks very much for the compliment. Norton tightened his arms around her. It's a well known fact, Laura, that men, unlike women, have two track minds. But seriously, well, more seriously, I do feel a sense of loss. I can understand that. Don't be so clinical. That's not the only reason. Oh, never mind. He gave up. It was not easy to explain, even to himself. He had succeeded on this mission beyond all reasonable expectation. What his men had discovered in Rama would keep scientists busy for decades. And above all, he had done it without a single casualty. But he had also failed. One might speculate endlessly, but the nature and the purpose of the Ramans was still utterly unknown. When Norton had glimpsed Rama for the last time, a tiny star hurtling outward beyond Venus, he knew that part of his life was over. He was just fifty five, but he felt he had left his youth down there on the curving central plain, among mysteries and wonders now receding inexorably beyond the reach of man. Whatever honors and achievements the future brought him, for the rest of his life he would be haunted by a sense of anticlimax and the knowledge of opportunities missed. So he told himself, but even then, he should have known better. And on far off Earth, Dr. Carlisle Pereira had as yet told no one of how he had wakened from a restless sleep with a message from his subconscious echoing in his brain. The Romans do everything in threes. You've been listening to Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke. Read by Robert Trumbull, adapted and directed by Stuart Lee, and produced by Family Radio Programming. For a complete listing of our other programs, send for a free catalog. Just write to us at the address you'll find on the label of this cassette.